I'm so excited for today's conversation. Um, and just as we start every episode, Julie and I like to extend our sincerest appreciation to all of our presenting sponsors. You can see their logos in front of you on the screen. So many of these sponsors have been with us elevating not only our episodes of the nonprofit show coming up on 300 soon, but really the sector at large. So uh, these organizations have been right here by your side, leaning in, lifting you up and supporting every step through this, you know, navigation period into recovery phase. So thank you um, each and every one of you for your support. Thanks to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And also I'm Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd CEO of the Raven Group. And this week we're packing a punch. So we've had some really amazing guests. We have some amazing guests coming up uh, later this week, many that I want you to check out. But today I want you to sit back or get your ear pods in, whatever you need to do to really focus, turn off your distractions. Um, and I would like to welcome Emily Holthouse, Managing Director, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Nonprofit HR. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Jared. I am so excited to join the conversation with y'all today. Thanks for having me. Mm. Okay, so we know you're a Texas girl when you say y'all. I just heard it. I love it. I love yeah. it. <laughs> I, have this weird, I have this weird dichotomy. I grew up in Minnesota, so I've got this strange Minnesota slash Texas accent going on. So you might hear a little bit of both of those. Things. Well, it's perfect. I grew up in the Southeast. I was born in Georgia, raised in South Carolina, and it slips up from time to time. So you are in good company. You have a Texota accent. Accent. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're excited to have you on because this is something that we've really been needing to talk about for a long time across our planet, especially our world. Um, in the nonprofit sector, I think we've been speaking about DEI a little bit more um, than others, but yet it is still incredibly misunderstood. And so we thought we'd really like to talk to you today because you came to us and it, you used the words actualizing your DEI strategy. And I think Jarrett and I were like, yeah, it's like making it work, not just talking about it. Mm -hmm. And we were so excited, Emily. So I got to start from the beginning sure. and have you describe and define DEI. Yeah, and it does mean a lot of different things to different people, so I'm glad we're going to ground here first. And okay. so from my vantage point, diversity is just all of those amazing things that we bring to a space and place that make us unique. And sometimes we'll say things like, oh, well, we need a diverse person for this, and we need a diverse person for that. A person on their own can't be diverse. It's about what we bring to a space or place, and once we're gathered, how those differences show up in between each other, right? So it can be things like we jump to race and age and gender often here in the U.S. That's sort of where we go first, but it's things like family status or things like geographic location or things like ability or things like body type. All of those things um, shape who we are and how we show up in spaces, how we make decisions, how we empathize, et cetera. So it's about all of that that we bring to the space. That's diversity. And, and we, don't, we can't change that. It is what it is. And inclusion is that part that says, okay, now what? We're all here in this space. We're all bringing these differences to the table and to the space and place. How do we engage each other? How do we make it so that Jared and Julia can show up as their authentic selves in a space and place? How do we embrace and pull people close to us, trust, make decisions, and, and help people really feel like they belong in an environment? And that's really the, the business case for inclusion and creating that environment is because it's about the other person. We don't want people coming to our spaces and places feeling like they don't belong. And I think we can all reflect on times where that's happened, right? Where we've been in places where we felt on the outside or the peripheral. So creating that inclusive environment where everyone can bring their whole authentic selves to the table is what we're talking about there. And then for me, equity is that systems part of it all. And, and people is important, interactions are important, but equally important is how well the systems and processes are working. And equity is this idea that we wanna make sure that people have what they need to be successful. We wanna acknowledge all of those different dimensions of diversity that maybe create some different starting points for individuals based on any of those dimensions of diversity that, that we talk about. Sometimes we transpose equality and equity, and I would say, actually, they're quite different concepts. So equality yeah. is that idea that we're going to treat everyone the same. It's the right thing to do, right? We all want equal rights to vote. Mm -hmm. Those of us that have kids, we want our kids to have equal snack at snack time. That's not a time for equity. But there is a time for equity when we say not everyone has the same starting point. So 
Jarrett, you might need something different to be successful in an environment than I might need based on different dimensions or different starting points that we have. And equity says we're going to solve for that. And we're going to give everyone what they need to be successful. And it may or may not be an equal thing that we need to get there. Right. And the reason why this is important is because we all live in these systems that we're often built far before we all came into them. And equity says sometimes we have to make adjustments for systems that aren't working for everyone and, and make that acknowledgement. And then at the end of the day too, our job is once we recognize the system might not be working, we help people get what they need, but then we also reimagine or dismantle or fix or blow up said system so that it begins to work for everyone regardless of their dimensions of diversity. So equity is sort of the foundational piece for me because it's the systems. And then diversity is how we're showing up in said system and inclusion is how we're treating each other in said system. Thank you for, for grounding this because I do think for us to have common definitions is really important in our organizations, but then also, you know, that's parallel for this discussion today. Now I've heard um, Jedi. So I've heard a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but now it's like, there's this new term called Jedi, which includes the J for justice. What exactly does that mean and how is that different? Yeah, it is different. And basically Jedi says that we're gonna center justice first and equity as that foundation. And then those things will drive the diversity and inclusion in organizations. And so I know that especially a lot of my uh, colleagues that are in this space where organizations that are really wanting to lean into the justice aspect of the conversation, they center that first and they make decisions, they set priorities based on justice first. And our, our firm is actually thinking about that too as a rebrand. And I was joking with somebody, it's it's important, but also how cool would it be to have Jedi Master on my, my uh, job, uh, on my uh, <laughs> cards or whatever, right? Or uh, Absolutely. My signature. So, you know, that's, that's cool too. But I think at the end of the day, it's really how do we recenter justice at the front of the conversation versus centering diversity at the front of the conversation. And it's just a mind shift or a different parallel for the work. Well, things are changing so quickly in society. I like that it makes it also, um, the imperative is to be flexible and, and to be um, at the forefront of new thought, action indeed, as opposed to just like making these statements it's more important to say, okay, this is how and why and what. Mm -hmm. Along with that, I'd love for you to talk to us about how do we get this into the other parts of our, our operational strategy, such as our mission, our you know mission, vision, and values, goals. What does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important for all organizations, but specifically nonprofit organizations to figure out why DEI is important to you being able to do your work and amplify your mission in the community. And I think at the end of the day, there are clear tiebacks. If we want to serve and support communities, that means all members of community. And so this conversation is not optional. It's imperative for sustainability across the board. And we also know that if it's not integrated into what is important for the organization. So if we don't sort of specifically call it out as part of our messaging, if we don't have it embedded as a strand throughout our strategic plan, we're all busy and we're doing the day-to-day -day and it's not gonna get prioritized and it's not gonna get done. We prioritize a lot of things in nonprofits. Who takes care of the money? We prioritize safety. We prioritize all these other things. I'm suggesting that DEI should hold that same level of prioritization that you would for any of the other things that we deem to be important. Because at the end of the day, it is important to your relevancy, your ability to amplify your mission, your ability to just survive long-term. Today in the United States right now, more than 50% of kids under the age of 18 identify as kids of color, multicultural kids of color. Today, that is our future. And if we're not positioning inclusiveness, equity, justice into what we do, our future is not gonna be connected to who we are as an organization. So um, it's incredibly important. And I think board members need to know and understand and ground and they need to be an accountability partner, team members throughout the organization. And then also just that connection to the mission we serve, our constituents and, and making sure that it's all tied together. Because if y'all remember what happened last year um, with all of the events in the Twin Cities, my hometown, and there were all these organizations that were throwing these statements up there. Hey, we believe in this, this, and this. And then their constituents and their team members are like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not how we're experiencing your organization. What you're saying doesn't match up to what we're experiencing. And 
the, we are held accountable in a way never before, right? Our teams are not gonna allow that to happen. So it needs to be embedded throughout the organization and clearly connected to how you're gonna perform your mission so that it isn't that smoke and mirrors effect that we saw with a lot of organizations last year. Absolutely. So many organizations, I wanna say, and we've talked about this, Julia. Yeah, we have that they, a lot. Made, they made the statement and that was it. Or, you know, they posted a black square on their Instagram or they posted something on social media and that was it. And they didn't go beyond that. Um, and so to really match up the actions with the statement and to you said, as to what you said, sorry, Emily, is uh, really seeing that, you know, what is your constituency base experiencing? What is their experience beyond that statement? Um, I, I question because what I'm seeing and I'm and I'm curious how I can be a better ally in this space this is not my bailiwick I am leaning in super hard um, into this conversation and learning so much um, but I'm curious by way of budget right so I do a lot of strategic planning process um, sessions I do a lot of conversations with the board and I do bring this topic up again not my area of expertise but what should I be advocating for when it comes to that commitment beyond um, really the statement? And I'm thinking specifically around budget. Now, I'm sure there's much more to that. And I'm welcome um, because I would like to learn as well how I can better, you know, provide information. Yeah. And, and I think it's an investment in the budget perspective and the money, but also the human investment is, is also equally important. So both. But I think as you're thinking about it, there's lots of things related to infusing equity into an organization or creating inclusive environments that cost you nothing. Right. And but there are also things like investing in embedding DEI education and learning throughout your employee experience. That might be a cost that you have to incur. That's really important. Another thing is you may need an outside person to help look under the hood to get at your current state because when you're swimming in the water, you yeah. can't see what's happening. So you may need to invest in an outside person to come in and help you to do that initial assessment to understand your current state. So those are investment pieces that I encourage people. What can't you do on your own to be successful and, and then make carve out time to invest in that. But then I also think about this idea of investing in people. And so um, knowing that if people in the organization are, are paid to have this be a part of what they eat, sleep and breathe every single day, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to get you further with integration than saying, oh, well, it belongs to everyone when it kind of belongs to no one, right? And so I also, depending on the evolution of your organization, if you're at a place to invest in a DEI leader at the high level of your organization where they have influence to blow up said systems and can influence the board and tell the CEO when they might have microaggressed and really have the power that is necessary. Making that investment at, at the strategic level in organizations, I think is a really important piece to the puzzle as well. So those are just a few things investment wise that I would say consider and think about. So Emily, is this something that you could add on as I'm thinking two things. You find somebody, and I'm thinking it's probably going to be more of like an HR professional that you add this title onto, or is this something like that you get an outside consultant who is your DEI or Jedi specialist and you somehow plug them in, you know, to your organization? I mean, can you do both or either? Or what, what does that yeah, look like? I, I've, seen, I've seen it work both ways, Julia, actually. Mm -hmm. And Ideally, at the end of the day, having someone, whether it's an outside person or an inside person, mm -hmm. that you are allowing to have the right level of influence and access to power and ability to change things is what's most important about that. And whether it's an outside person that you connect with to do it with you and, or you grab somebody internally. And I've seen it connected to the HR function. I've also seen it disconnected from the HR function and just a function on the senior team that that is what we do. We drive inclusion, access, belonging, engagement internally and externally. And that's that person's whole job, right? So I've also seen it work really well depending on the structure of the organization to be separate from HR because really DEI, HR is an important part of it. You know, bias creeps into HR life cycle systems so fast, right? So that's important, but also it's really broader than that. And, and DEI needs to permeate the entire organization. So you also don't wanna get it siloed that it's just an HR thing and that that team is just yeah. responsible for it too. I, I see that and I appreciate you kind of reframing that for me because I think I have placed it just on as an HR thing and I can see 
that if your organization does that in some ways, it's just going to be, it's going to be lumped in with like insurance benefits. <laughs> you know, It won't be given the attention that it's due. I, I was really interested in, and you mentioned this um, briefly in the chitty chat chat, talk to us about assessments. And so we can figure out what we need and where we're struggling. Yeah, I absolutely. And Julia, just one quick thing that you made me think of, and, and I also look at it like this, like the CEO in the organization, that stands for chief executive officer, but really that's also chief equity officer. I also see the CEO is having a big role to play too, as, as we're talking about that as well. Um, I but love, uh, love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every CEO, you know, that's part of what you're in charge of as the leader of the organization is, is having equity be at the core of what you do. Can and- we take this further? And, and I don't mean to, <laughs> to stop you right here, but I'm thinking <clears throat> oftentimes in our nonprofit sector, the CEO title is interchanged with the executive director, right? Like that is another title that I think I hear sometimes more often the CEO, but I'm assuming that's also equity director. Yes, agreed. <laughs> so it doesn't matter um, if you are at the head of the organization where power is concentrated, yeah. equity is part of your job. Inclusion mm-hmm. is part of your job. Setting the tone for all of that, allocating resources, being the champion, that is part of your job. And, you know, Jared, you talked earlier about that idea of allyship and how do I be a stronger mm-hmm. ally? Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to push you. Like, I want you to be on ally because ally kind of tastes like I'm cheering for something that's outside of me and I'm going to support you and, and I'm going to do that. But with equity and inclusion and, and things like dismantling racism organizations, we all need to be in the game together in that. And it impacts all of us, right? And we all need to be active and sort of seeing ourselves getting past. And especially if you're at the top of the organization where power is concentrated, it just needs to be about how you're active and, and equity is part of your leadership brand, just who you are showing up in the organization. And whether you identify as someone from a marginalized population or not, it doesn't matter because it takes all of us to win this game together and all of us need to be active in it together. Thank it. you. Thank you for that challenge and, and for educating me um, really, really in the language, right? And the, as I had said, I am leaning into this hardcore, a lot of learned behavior from the geographic area in which I grew up, right? And so learning through that and of course, spending so much time in the nonprofit sector and in so many vulnerable communities. Um, so thank you. That That comes gently and I appreciate it. Well, and, and also allyship is an important stop along the way. I'm just saying that's not the end stop. Like we want to keep right. going, right? And sort of get into that level of ownership because at the end of the day, when we all feel that level of ownership, that's when it's going to start to change quicker, right? And, and for us to get in that together is, is really important. Well, and let's talk about those stops, right? Like how do we know that we've achieved success? Um, is that something that it's like, okay, we've put in, you know, a, a Jedi, I really like using that term. We've put in a Jedi policy. We've engaged in a person, consultant, what have you, like, when do we know that we've achieved success? Yeah, so that's a great question. And to be honest, this is an everyday, all day on repeat activity, right? And so success really is about integration. And it's about our leaders making decisions to support equity outcomes every day, all day. And so, you know, I tell my clients like this, we'll jump in with you, but there are no stickers at the end of the consulting engagement to say you've arrived, you don't get to put something in your window that says you made it. Right. the way that you know and understand is that you will start to see some of the outcomes that you're hoping for shift or change. You will start to see your relationships with your community broadening. You will see your staff being more engaged and more connected and staying longer. So you're going to start to see a lot of the changes. Your, your diversity metrics will be more reflective of the communities that you're looking to serve. You will have more diverse voices and perspectives and places of power in your organization. You'll start to see all these things shifting, but at the end of the day, there is no arrival point to go and, and getting in that space with each other just requires all of us to be leading this way long term. And, and that's why I love that y'all are talking about this idea of integration in organizations because the checkbox approach isn't going to get you there. And getting to the end of the checklist does not mean that you're finished by any means. It's just really thinking about what's next and what we need yeah. to continue to move forward. Well, you know, I would think when you're measuring success too, it, it seems to me at this point, measuring success is starting with acknowledgement. Like, okay, we are gonna be on the journey of this discussion and practice 
And there are a heck of a lot of people that are, will not or do not see this of value. And, you know, I think we've got to be able to say this is heavy lifting, but ultimately this does make us more successful. Um, and we don't know what that looks like because we've never done it before. Yeah, absolutely. And I think measuring success does start with the question you posed previously. It's just understanding your starting point, right? You have to know how does it feel to be in your organization? Where is power concentrated? How do we make decisions with each other? How transparent are we? So what does the environment feel like is what you need to know and understand. And I always say to people, do you know? Do you know the answer to that question? How does it feel to be part of your organization from a staff standpoint, from a constituent standpoint? You need to get the answer to that. You also need to know and understand, are there any historical things that have happened in the past that we need to acknowledge and own in order to let us go forward? I was working with a client the other day and, and they were challenged and struggled because they had a large Hispanic Latino population in their community. And they're like, Emily, we just can't get that group to engage with us, we try different things. And what I asked them to do was to go out to that community and have some conversations. And what they recognize is that something that organization did 15 years ago to really diminish the value of that community, that 15 years later, that community still is not ready to re-engage because we've never acknowledged the inequity that occurred before, right? So getting that starting point is important. And then also taking a, a stab at what are your systems and processes like today? Are they working for everyone? Are they not? Specifically, the employee life cycle is that place. So looking at the people side, looking at the system side and saying, where is our starting point and documenting some of those benchmarks and not feeling bad about it. Right? I have a question. <laughs> yeah, Jared. Um, who has those conversations, right? Yeah, I was, who, goes I was into, who goes into the community? Um, and I'm sure that's a multifaceted response, but um, my, my first thought, honestly, Emily, is um, maybe a, a near peer of the community. So someone that, you know, um, is a part of the organization already, but also has ties into the community. Can you, can you tell us more about that? I mean, I would say maybe yes and maybe no, because okay. at the end of the day, if I'm the executive director of that organization and I'm in charge of charting the path forward, maybe I just got here, but that doesn't matter because I now represent the organization. And so if I'm going and needing to connect with the community, that community is gonna to wanna to hear from me. Wow, we, we messed this up a while ago. We, we acknowledge that we're on our journey to get better. We want to connect and understand how to repair what we need to repair. And, and sometimes it just, it, it comes from that place of humility from the organization overall. And so I'm not sure that it needs to be someone who has the connector point. It really has to be just authentically like, listen, we're trying to do better here. We're, we're on our journey and we're here to acknowledge and understand and listen and hear so that we can learn and get better, right? And that needs to come from the top of the organization. Oftentimes I will say the executive director, your board members, your key team members um, need to be involved in it. And, and it needs to be a commitment on behalf of the organization. So it can't just be one person that communities know really well that's out there with them because people will see that as sort of, well, they sent that person out here because they know that they can connect with us more. And so it really is about, yeah. we're gonna get in that uncomfortable space of saying, you know what, we're gonna own it and we're committed to doing better. And then your actions need to reflect that commitment of movement. Back right? to actions, yes. Yep. Thank yep. you. You know, I think that it's almost like, I, I think of when you, when you speak about this, Emily, it's like the old fashioned PR train, you know, we're gonna get the leader back out into the community and introduce and chat and, you know, have a coffee, have whatever, but put, put those leaders on the front line so that they can be hearing and seeing what things look like. And we don't do that enough with our leaders. We, we're, we're sending the PR folks out or we're not, don't you think, Jarrett, you know, we're, we're, we're stepping back. And I don't know if it's like, we fool ourselves into thinking, oh, we have so much to do in the office, we can't get out. And certainly the pandemic has, you know, changed that. But it just seems to me that we don't have leaders willing to go out and, and say, to your point, this is going to be hard. And I look like this, so I don't know what that looks like. And I need help and I'm willing to, you know, learn and, and change. 
but it's- I think too, one of the things, and again, I, I'm sharing this from a, a very place of, a big place of vulnerability. Um, sometimes I don't know what to say, right? Or I'm afraid that I'm going to say the wrong thing. Um, and I think many of us that are leaning into this space and, you know, do this in a place for our organization, um, I just want to throw that out that that might be a challenge or an obstacle that is being thought of. That's a real thing. And Jared, when we're talking about that idea of moving beyond allyship, that mm -hmm. is one of the biggest things that leaders need to get past is I, that fear of making a mistake preventing you from getting an action, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, you're not going to say everything perfectly. You're going to make mistakes. I've been doing this work for 20 years, y'all, and I say the wrong thing sometimes. It's sure. true. It happens. So you will, you will get into those spaces of uncomfort. You will get into spaces where you didn't frame something properly. But the more we just start to say, we're going to get out there because being in action is better than being perfect because that authenticity over perfection is what's required here. And at the end of the day, you might get misunderstood and, and said your motivations aren't right, even though you know that they are, but that doesn't mean you stop. That means you just sort of keep going. And the more you lean into that discomfort, the easier it becomes as you continue to do it, right? But Jarrett, what you're naming is real and it's valid. And we just have to say, how do we push through that? And how do we begin to sort of go to that humble place and Julia, to your point, getting out into the communities and having those conversations is, is a scary thing to do. A, we might not know what the answer is going to be, or we might not be ready for what the answer or the conversation is, but it's also required for us to really be able to make the impact for our entire community. You know, it's just part of what we need to get into the, to the system of doing, because if we're going to sit in our office and do things to communities versus doing things with communities and through communities, long term, it's not going to serve you or your community the way that it needs to be served. So yeah. and that's why we're here. Nonprofits are here to help provide a solution to a community problem. That's right. Baseline. You don't make cookies, you don't build microchips, you don't build cars. You're about building community, kids, families, adults, yeah. engagement. Yeah. And, and that's, Emily, that's what it is. You wow. have been amazing. I'm looking at my clock and I'm like, no, I just want you to stand still. <laughs> I know. I, Emily, wow, this is amazing. So we had your CEO on a couple of weeks ago and we thought, wow, okay, we've died and gone to heaven. And she, we were talking about women and leadership. We loved that. And then um, somebody else on your team was like, I don't know, wait till Emily's on. She's pretty amazing. <laughs> so. Y'all are very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> And so, you're hiring. The nonprofit HR team is hiring. I just saw that on LinkedIn the other day. So uh, check them out. They've got a great, robust page of open positions. So yeah. And here's yes, Emily's come work with us. We love, we love talented, amazing people from all over the country. So I love, thank you for throwing that out there. Please Absolutely. come work with us if you're interested. Yes. It's, it's amazing. Well, this has been fabulous. You know, um, we need to have more of these discussions. And so um, we've got to get you back on because I've, I've learned a lot. And I know that um, this is something that, to your point, it needs to be at the forefront, coming from the top down and then linking across our organization. So this is super cool. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the nonprofit uh, excuse me, the Raven Group. I was going to say, of the nonprofit nerd group. <laughs> um, I've only said this now for more than a year. It's it's okay, you know, like it happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, wow, what a great conversation. I just want to also um, thank uh, Mary Highland, who had me on her Inspired Leadership podcast. If you want to check that out, um, here's the link. It's really an interesting wrap up of what are some of the things that I've learned over the past year? Um, and um, it, it was a great conversation. So if you're looking for <laughs> more time with me, which I don't think you need to be, but uh, I wanted to thank Mary for including uh, me on that as well. Hey, presenting sponsors without you, we would not be here. And we are very, very grateful that you allow us the opportunity to come in and have such amazing guests as we've had today with Emily Holdhouse. Um, so basically, thank you, thank you, thank you for opening this door that we've walked through and continue to walk through every day. And so um, we want to make sure that that you support them as they support us. Another amazing way for me to start my day 
What say ye, Ms. Jarrett? Phenomenal. Emily, I, and I said this to uh, your CEO, and I was just like, you know, I want to pick a, a handful of people to go on a retreat with, and you're definitely on that list. So thank you oh, for joining us today. Let's do it. Let's do let's it, Jared. Do it. All right. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome you back anytime. I know we have some of your other colleagues from the nonprofit HR joining us, and I look forward to our conversations and discussions with them as well. So um, thanks to all of you joining us for another amazing episode of the Nonprofit Show. Hope you'll join us tomorrow. And until then, stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone.